been a pretty remarkable day. Thanks for staying with us here on CBS News. I'm Errol Barnett. And I'm Lana Zak. Here's a quick look at some of the top stories we're following. Another dramatic day on Capitol Hill, where the House went through several more votes for Speaker. Lawmakers cannot be sworn in, and the additional business of Congress cannot happen until a Speaker is selected. The family of Buffalo Bill star Damar Hamlin says doctors are lowering the amount of oxygen being given to the 24-year-old in the hopes of removing him from a ventilator. Hamlin remains in critical condition after he went into cardiac arrest following a tackle during Monday night's game against the Bengals. And California is bracing for more severe weather. The National Weather Service says a so-called bomb cyclone is moving across the state tonight, bringing with it potentially deadly flooding, high winds, mountain snow, and an increased risk of landslides. Pope Francis is praising his late predecessor, Pope Emeritus Benedict the 16th, one day before he will preside over his funeral. Yeah, he called the late pontiff a, quote, great master of, of catechus. Catechus, that's yes, exactly that, right. Yes, that was an interesting quote from him. Um, he also went on to say, um, with acute and gentle thought while holding a general audience in Vatican City today. Uh, just a short distance away, thousands of people continue to honor Pope Benedict. Today marks the third and final day of public viewings at St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, joining us now from Rome is CBS News foreign correspondent Chris Livesay. Hi there, Chris. Roughly 130... 35,000 people have already paid tribute to the Pope Emeritus as he lies there in state. Tell us what the atmosphere is like in Vatican City during this historic moment in time. Also, given these other parts of the equation that are so different, the fact that he retired and was the first pope to retire in 600 years. All right, Lana Narrow. Well, there's actually a lot more anticipation than you might expect. There's anticipation for the funeral that's coming tomorrow and all of the faithful who are lining up behind me. And by the way, these are the last ones who are going to get to see uh, Pope Benedict lying in state because in just a few minutes they're going to seal off his coffin. Now there have, as you mentioned, been thousands of people to see him in the last few days. Uh, however, they've been steadily in and out, not like the, the throngs of people who waited in line for days days, mind you, some of them hours, but many of them days to see the, the body of Pope John Paul II lying in state. Um, now, there's also anticipation for what comes next. Now, even though we already have uh, a pope in, in Pope Francis, now we no longer have a retired pope. And that was a pope who was also donning white and calling himself a pope uh, living here in the Vatican. When he resigned, he established a precedent, basically saying it was okay for popes to leave the papacy uh, in another way besides dying. So now that there's no retired pope here at the Vatican, the big question is, does that free up a space for Pope Francis to retire one day? Today, he's 86 years old. That's one year older than Pope Benedict was when he retired. And Pope Francis has talked about retiring, possibly, if he ever reaches a place where he never he doesn't feel capable of fulfilling his papal duties. In fact, last month, he said he's already drafted a resignation letter that he's ready to submit in case his health doesn't allow him to carry out his job. And I guess that is one of the legacies of Pope Emeritus Benedict's time, that you can line up and do things differently than was done before when it comes to the changing of, of power, essentially. Um, what other details can you tell us about the service uh, that Pope Francis is overseeing and, and taking place right now? Well, the biggest differences from a typical papal funeral is that since he wasn't a reigning pope or a sitting pope, um, you don't have the heads of state flocking here from around the world. So President Joe Biden will not be here. In fact, the only two official delegations that were invited to the funeral were from Germany, where Pope Benedict was from, and from Italy, where the Vatican is. There will be some other delegations, some heads of states from here and there, but, but nothing compared to when a sitting pope dies. You even have a number of cardinals who aren't coming. 
which normally when a pope dies, cardinals from all corners of the world would convene here in Vatican City. For the rest of it, it'll look like a typical papal funeral. Uh, you'll have Pope Francis celebrating the Requiem Mass. Inside the coffin of Pope Benedict will be placed some of the uh, commemorative medals and coins that were minted during his papacy. You'll have what's known as the Rogito, uh, the deed that will be placed inside of his coffin. That's sort of a, a history of his papacy. And then he'll be buried uh, in the grottos beneath St. Peter Basilica in the exact same tomb where his predecessor, John Paul II, was buried before he was beatified and then eventually became a saint and laid to rest uh, near the sculpture of the Pietà sculpted by Michelangelo. But of course, the biggest difference is that another pope is presiding over the funeral. This is only the second time in the 2,000 year history of the Catholic Church that that's happened. That really puts it into context. Doesn't yeah, it? really interesting. Chris Lefsey, thank you very much. Thank you. President Biden traveled to Kentucky today to tout a $1.6 billion bridge project. And he appeared alongside Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell in a rare joint appearance. President Biden publicly um, commended Senator McConnell today. He emphasized the Brent Spence bridge project would not have been completed without him. Funds for the new undertaking come from the bipartisan infrastructure law signed by President Biden in 2021. All this is about making an investment in America's heartland and America's people and America's future. It's about making things in America again. It's about good jobs. It's about the dignity of work. It's about respect. And folks, it's about damn time we're doing it. Joining us now is CBS News Chief White House Correspondent Nancy Cordes. Uh, Nancy, it's it's significant, obviously, that President Biden is appearing alongside the highest current ranking Republican uh, there in Washington, the Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. Um, talk to us about why this bridge in particular is significant, as in addition to the fact that they're both together. Right. Uh, not only is it rare for the president to appear alongside the Republican leader in his home state, it's rare for him to appear alongside any Republican lawmaker. When the president comes to town, these Republicans tend to make themselves scarce. Uh, you know, it's not generally thought of as a great thing for them politically to be standing there side by side with the uh, president who's a leader of the opposite party. Uh, but in this case, uh, the president and the Republican leader have similar goals. They both were big champions of of uh, infrastructure spending. In fact, it's one of the uh, rare areas of bipartisan agreement. It's very popular with voters back home in Kentucky and around the country. And this bridge in particular is a real lifeline uh, for uh, people in Kentucky, both when it comes to commerce, uh, when it comes to personal travel. It connects Kentucky to, uh, to Ohio. And uh, this is a bridge that Mitch McConnell has been trying to get fixed for years. So he knows that it's going to be a win back home. Beyond that, uh, frankly, it was uh, no surprise to anyone that this was going to be a week of turmoil for the Republican Party, at least on the House side, not on the Senate side. Mm -hmm. But Mitch McConnell may have wanted uh, to get out of Washington, <laughs> D.C. this week and, and sort of present a counterpoint to voters watching at home to say, look, Republicans can work for the things you care about. They can work with the other side. Uh, don't pay attention to what's going on <laughs> there on Capitol Hill. It'll all get worked out. So uh, a little bit of, uh, of, of politics there as he works to kind of uh, change the focus from uh, everything that we're seeing on Capitol Hill right now as House Republicans try to figure out who is going to be their next leader. Yeah, I think we could describe that as counter-programming, right. right? Knowing what would be happening <laughs> on one smart. side um, of Capitol Hill, this certainly is in stark relief. Nancy Cordes, great to chat with you. Thanks for joining us from the White House. You're welcome. Sure thing. We are going to take a short break, but yeah. stay with us. What a day. You're streaming CBS News, always on. Governors are being sworn in across the country, and during his swearing-in ceremony Tuesday, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis took aim at Washington's, quote, floundering federal establishment. CBS News political director Finn Gomez joined Anne-Marie and Vlad earlier to discuss. Let us Happy start New Year. with Governor DeSantis. What does yeah. his legislative agenda tell us about his political agenda and ambitions? 
Yeah, Vlad, you know, it's really interesting because DeSantis kicked off his inaugural address yesterday really with, as you said, an eye on 2024. The Florida governor, who has become a darling of the right and is now considering this White House run, focused more on national issues in his speech than just Florida-centric ones, uh, so issues that are important to the Republican base, not just in Florida, but across the country, and it really sounded to me like a potential blueprint for a White House run. And, and I think DeSantis and his organizers, organizers were really trying to give up a presidential vibe. You know, he called uh, Florida a, quote, refuge of sanity and criticized uh, what he called a floundering federal establishment in Washington, D.C. Um, and, you know, he really targeted uh, national issue, issues uh, that um, the Republican base have been really focused on, including the inflation, uh, the federal response to the COVID-19 and the crisis at the southern border. Uh, these are all frequent targets by Republicans against Biden, uh, though he never really never directly mentioned the president's name. He also never named the former president, Donald Trump. They were once close allies. Uh, the former president, of course, jumped into the presidential fray just after the midterms, and most polls show those two are uh, the leading Republicans on top of the, you know, potential presidential heap. Uh, and DeSantis, you know, talking to Republicans, he is expected to jump in later this year. And um, so I think there's no doubt that, that he is eyeing that 2024 uh, race, and I think what he said yesterday and, and really focused on that, on the national perspective, and not really on the details of, a, uh, of his agenda coming up, uh, shows that his focus is on uh, this White House bid. So let's, Potential White House let us yeah. head a little further north, uh, Finn, sure. uh, and head to Michigan. During her swearing-in remarks, Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer uh, promised to work across the aisle. As a Democratic leader in a swing state, how is she trying to appeal to Republicans? Yeah, Whitmer uh, directly uh, named the two Republican new leaders in the state House and Senate, uh, which was something what she's really been trying to do more is to 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 reach out to the uh, to the opposition. And Whitmer has really risen to the national stage for winning in this battleground state of Michigan, and is seen by many Democratic Party uh, strategists that I've spoken to as a rising star uh, with a really a national trajectory and. Um, as you mentioned, she was just sworn in, uh, and she said her focus will be on getting things done, uh, including in reducing uh, reducing gun violence in the state, investing in, in education, tackling climate change, and lowering taxes for retirees. But she's really looking to, uh, you know, have this olive branch out to Republicans there, and with you know, again, with a, a lot of natural national interests coming her way from within the from within the Democratic Party. Kathy Hochul was sworn in right. Sunday. She is the first woman elected governor of the state of New York. Let's talk about the significance. Uh, yeah, Vlad, she is the first governor, uh, uh, woman governor, uh, woman to become governor in, elected uh, in the Empire State. Uh, she uh, uh, became governor after the Andrew Cuomo, of course, uh, stepped down amid scandal. Uh, she said in her address that she was not trying to make history but make a difference, but her win did have a historical difference, an historical impact as the first woman elected uh, in the, uh, to governor in the Empire State. Um, and of course, uh, she is also—the uh, bigger narrative also, by the way, uh, is the fact that 2022 saw a record-breaking year for female, female gubernatorial candidates uh, across the country. Twelve women will be serving as governors in 2023, both Republicans and Democrats, so a banner year. Yeah, including in Arizona, which we haven't spoken about right. in a while. Mm. But uh, people may or may not be surprised that Carrie Lake has, has not conceded yet. Uh, and, uh, we, you know, they've already sworn in. I think, have they already sworn yeah, in? Governor Kathy Ho Katie yeah, Hobbs, right, today. Yeah. So um, uh, Carrie Lake, yeah, he, yeah. she's suing. The lawsuit was thrown out. She says she's going to file an appeal. What is going on there? Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, Katie Hobbs, the, the Democrat, uh, was sworn in as the new governor of Arizona. Uh, but Carrie Lake has continued her litigious uh, uh, actions uh, against the results of the 2022 uh, gubernatorial election. Uh, Lake, who was a, a MAGA star uh, and backed by Donald Trump, 
uh, sued in November after she lost to Hobbs. Uh, she was claiming widespread fraud, pointing to defective ballot printers uh, at some uh, polling places in Maricopa County, which is which is the largest county in Arizona. But uh, an Arizona judge, as you mentioned, threw out that lawsuit, uh, said there was lacking uh, clear, uh, clear and convincing evidence. Um, but she has appealed uh, to the state's appellate court and also filed a separate motion to transfer uh, the appeal to Arizona's state Supreme Court. Uh, we have not heard yet if that's uh, and it's unclear if they're going to take up this case. Uh, but again, the fact of the matter is that Hobbs was sworn in as Arizona's new governor just a few days ago, and it's just highly unlikely that these appeals will change any of that. All right, Finn, thank you very much. Thank you. A U.S. national park made up of uninhabited islands in the Florida Keys is now closed after hundreds of migrants arrived there over the weekend. CBS News Homeland Security and Justice reporter Nicole Skanga joined the stream earlier to discuss the growing crisis there. Nicole, this is an intriguing story. Uh, you, you know, you frequently hear from politicians about the southern border and the influx of migrants coming into the United States there. Uh, but I somehow don't think we're going to hear the same noise from specifically Republicans about these Cuban migrants, or maybe we have. Yeah, and Vlad, it does speak to the desperation here. The U.S. National Park Service closing Dry Tortugas National Park off the Florida Keys Monday after nearly 300 asylum seekers arriving by boat from Cuba. You know, once a federal prison following the Civil War, Fort Jefferson, the historic landmark there, now seemingly uh, a refuge in a twist of irony, park personnel providing food, water, medical attention to those making landfall, many of whom I'm told had not eaten in days arrived wet, they arrived dehydrated. One tourist I spoke with who was camping at the National Park during the New Year's witnessed these arrivals. I believe we've, we've played video um, and can share it again on, you know, sharing on Twitter that the shouts of relief and tears of joy will stick with me for the rest of my life. That's what that camper was saying. Now, so far, U.S. Coast Guard says that as of last night, they've removed 90 of those migrants. The remaining are expected to be transferred today to U.S. Border Patrol officials in Key West. Migrants who are processed routinely undergo what's called a credible fear assessment to determine if they have a fear of persecution if returned to their home country and should be given the chance to apply for asylum here. New reports, though, from nonprofits, including the local Catholic Charities chapter, indicating many Cubans have arrived at their doorstep with expedited removal orders without that opportunity for asylum. That puts many of these migrants in legal limbo. So it's not just this national park. Authorities have been responding to maritime asylum seekers across the Florida Keys. Why are we seeing an influx right now? Yeah, Anne-Marie, that's a great point, because the national park closure isn't happening in a vacuum. And in the past four days, a federal law enforcement official told CBS News authorities have encountered more than 800 migrants, primarily from Cuba, but some also arriving from Haiti, coming by boat in the areas surrounding the Florida Keys. The official I spoke with couldn't even give me a firm number in recent days, because encounters are ongoing. Now, obviously, communist government uh, Cuba is no stranger to this sort of exodus, but the island nation is really now experiencing a historic number of those seeking asylum through overland routes, um, you know, through Central America and Mexico, while others are navigating the Caribbean in what are makeshift vessels to make it to U.S. shores. You know, this amid tighter U.S. sanctions, economic hardship intensified by the pandemic, massive inflation, including soaring food prices and power outages. I know, Vlad, you've spent extensive time documenting conditions in Haiti following devastating earthquakes in 2010 and 2021, um, you know, in addition to natural disasters, individuals there fleeing violence, obviously, poverty, political turmoil following that July 2021 presidential assassination, especially now that gang leaders have lifted the fuel blockade in Haiti, previously closing off much of the island. Mm. Well, if history is an indicator, uh, it, it would seem that uh, many of those Haitian migrants will be treated very differently than those arriving from Cuba. Uh, but how does the amount of migrants uh, arriving uh, specifically in that part of the country compared to years or even past months. Yeah, so since October 1st of last year, the Miami sector of Border Patrol says they've experienced a 400 percent increase in migrant encounters. And just to give you a more recent sense, I mean, in the past three months, Coast Guard crews interdicted more than 4,100 Cubans. That's pretty 
close to the roughly 6,200 Cuban migrants encountered in all of fiscal year 2022. You know, in the case of Cuban migrants, the numbers of those leaving the country has now surpassed the Mariel boat lift exodus. You want to talk about history. Some of our viewers might recall the economic downturn that prompted that event back in 1980. Haitians also fleeing in record numbers not seen for almost 20 years. Other Caribbean nations and territories, Turks and Caicos, the Bahamas, confirming similar encounters of asylum seekers taking to these makeshift boats. You know, and keep in mind, we're talking about this ahead of a possible end to the Title 42 pandemic-era border restrictions. That public health law has given U.S. border authorities the power to expel some migrants from the country without allowing them to make that asylum claim. The Supreme Court expected to hear arguments from Republican-controlled states defending that Trump-era policy when their session begins next month. All right, Nicole, thank you very much. Thank you. Coming up next, it is Red and Blue. We'll be speaking with Republican Congressman Don Bacon of Nebraska about the efforts to name a new House Speaker. Plus, we'll hear from a former advisor to the 2012 Mitt Romney presidential campaign about why the drama in the House could change the perception of the GOP moving forward. Red and Blue is next. You're streaming CBS News.